going to get started. Um, there's some very exciting stuff to get through. But first, I'm going to invite Joe up to talk about the Project Inspires grant we got. So many of you know what's going on here, and this is more interesting for me too. This is why you see it. I'm looking why I'm showing up to Bob. Um, so the reason why I'm showing up to Bob is Bob has fantastic infrastructure that allows us to do a lot um, of it. Uh, supplemental training that you guys don't have to pay for. And that's kind of the name of the game. So um, ABA faculty kind of collectively got together a few years ago and wrote a grant um, to support some of the new incoming ABA students take tuition um, and stipends and or, some percentage of all of this, just like all of you, yeah, that, that, that comes with the um, <clears throat> The name of the game at OSHEP right now, which is a federal funding agency that's interested in, in, in supporting um, graduate programs that teach special education teachers how to teach <laughs> and related service providers like BCBA how to teach. Um, what they really value these days is interdisciplinary collaboration, so some acknowledgement that like, there's no one profession that can meet all of the needs uh, of the students that we're trying to serve in schools and in related settings. And so the collaboration that made a lot of sense um, for this department is certainly special education with ABA, these two things went hand in glove. And also um, we chose child development, child psychologist. I don't know if Vicky's here right now. Not, she wrote it with us as well. Um, we decided uh, one of the one of the things that are very young field is kind of grappling with right now is misapplications of behavior analysis and the ways in which this very effective technology can do exactly what's intended to do is make people do what you want them to do. What we haven't considered as well as we could have as a field is the collateral impact of that and the circumstances under which it's okay versus not okay. So we have this scary effective technology that's neither good nor bad and, and whether, whether or not it's used to help people and whether or not this collateral, collateral harmful effects is kind of dependent on individual practitioners' ability to identify, to, to be aware that it's possible to harm people and then to do something about it. <clears throat> so um, there's really good content in the college on concepts like um, trauma and child development. And we can't afford those classes because we're spending all of your credits on the ABA stuff so you can get your credential. And so instead of asking you to take another nine credits, in another department, what we brokered was we pulled aside stuff. We made a deal with the site department for some of your credits, for some of their credits. And then and there was other content that we thought the entire ABA program would benefit from. And so we, we kind of like put a, set aside a little bit of money for things like workshops to kind of supplement your education, things that would otherwise cost a three credit class or a one credit class or a two credit class. We figured we'll just cover it, do it insert it into the BABA infrastructure and just allow everyone to benefit from it. So this is one of those times. It's gonna happen roughly once a semester throughout anyone's tenure here, because this is a five-year grant. Um, if you could just pop it in there real quick. Where we've been, um, the story starts with mental health and wraparound services. That's so the beginning <laughs> of, uh, of our series starts actually next semester. And for those of you who haven't been experienced, to the, uh, haven't experienced that yet, we're gonna get um, some guest speakers that are just going to talk about trauma and the biological impact of trauma on our physiology <laughs> and, and and then uh, kind of open up the way that other experts in other fields have, have attempted to address this um, and show us science and, and outcomes that we might not be exposed to maybe specifically um, over the summer we talked about tiered systems of support both for academic and for behavioral interventions and uh, casey chauvin kind enough to give us that treatment, <laughs> that intervention or that, that training. And right now, Chernagori, Dr. Chernagori is gonna show us how to merge these two concepts together and how to embed trauma-informed care into tiered systems of support that are appropriate for schools and settings. And then for the lucky few who are actually on the grant, we have a six week Saturday series. I'm sure you all love. Yes, the laughing means yes, right? I'm so we're teaching you how to how to design interactive and engaging online content because that is the world that we live in right now. We don't we can be like caught off guard by COVID once, but not twice, right? So we just want you all to be prepared to deliver instruction through as many different formats as possible. And so if that sounds good <laughs> to anyone who's not on this Saturday. We do have slots and scholarships. If you want to wake up 
at nine o'clock or be at, I'm, I'm not even gonna finish this. Zoom, yeah. it's Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, you guys are not gonna like me. Can you guys fill in up here? Because we have some professionals coming um, directly from their jobs that are gonna come in and I wanna reserve the side spots for them. So people on the side oh, move to the front. really quick before I give it over to her department um, announcements. Supervision was emailed out. If you have a question or concern, please contact Molly Todd about it. Um, Kelly Lamino asked me to remind everyone that there's an ice cream social next Tuesday in here. Um, check your email for the specific time, but it's next Tuesday. And it's gonna, it was on pause because of COVID, but we're actually gonna start having free socials every month put on by them. Yeah. <laughs> Without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and give it over to Mary. If you guys can welcome her. Well, hi everyone. Great to be here. Um, I am Dr. Mary Chernobori. I'm a product of this very department in this very building. Uh, starting in 2007, I uh, uh, entered the PhD program in the special ed department. So this is a little bit like coming full circle for me. Um, I've spoken in this room several times, over, multiple times over the years, but also participated in events just like you all in this room. Um, I think I want to take a minute, since I'll be the talking head in the room, to just share a little bit about my journey, with how I got to where I am today, right? Um, so first off, as you know, we're going to be talking about trauma-informed school practices and integrating trauma-informed care into multi-tiered systems of support, right? Um, so personally, on a personal note, I've had more than my fair share of adversity in life, which is not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, I wouldn't trade it in um, for anything because it helped me rise above and be far more than I could have otherwise been without experiencing suffering in life, right? Like suffering and adversity is, is a part of the human condition and we can let it bring us down, or if we understand some of this science, um, we can use it for to be so much more. What I'm kind of tapping into here is a, a term called post-traumatic growth, right? Which, which is a little outside of the topic here. But also, so aside from personal stuff, um, that it took me into at least my mid-30s to understand or to begin to understand, but that helped a lot to understand what was happening in my professional life. Um, so in my professional life, uh, I uh, an undergrad, I was a psychology undergrad student and at my university at the time, they offered teaching certification in the area of emotional behavior disorders. And I said, oh, I don't think I really wanna teach. I wanna go into clinical psych, something like that. So I graduated with my bachelor's and while I was deciding, you know, applying to jobs, deciding what to do master's program wise, um, my friend from my bachelor's program said, hey, I'm working at this self-contained school for students with severe emotional disturbance. Why don't you just come, you know, substitute teach for a little while while you're figuring out what you're doing? And, you know, I had another job too. Um, and I said, cool, let me do that. So I started teaching. My purpose in sharing that is I had no 
idea how to teach. I haven't been trained to be a teacher. And I'm also working with students with intensive, highly intensive needs. I mean, uh, straight away in the first week, I remember distinctly a student uh, who, had, who had just come out of inpatient and she, it was intense. And, you know, there was some physical safety for me, including my own at, at hand. Um, but nonetheless, I loved it. I fell in love with it very quickly. The principal offered me a full-time role that, for, that stayed at the time. I could start teaching on emergency certification with promise I'm going to get my master's quickly, which I did, right? But again, another point in sharing that, when I started teaching, I didn't know what I was doing. I also didn't have some of this language. Um, I was just working on my human instincts and you know, I'm not an unintelligent person, right? Um, but I did know two things right away. And one thing that I knew, again, school in another state, you don't know what the food of the school is, but the things that were happening in that building, again, self-contained school for students with severe emotional disturbance, I was teaching middle school, they were not helping. First of all, there wasn't a lot of focus on academics, though I was certainly teaching academics. Um, the full focus was on behavior, but it was highly punitive, highly control and compliance oriented, quiet rooms with the doors, the staff stood like this and kept kids in there and, and um, you know, in isolation, restraints and screaming students, sometimes maybe teachers also was commonplace in that building, right? So on day one, I knew like, hey, what's happening here is really not helping these kids, like what's going on? So I knew that and, um, I wanted to be able to do more. So I taught for about five years. For four of those years, it was in that school and then later a satellite classroom in a mainstream play school, which didn't have those same factors, but it had other safety concerns, right? Because these students had needs that couldn't be met by me and one para in isolation in a school that didn't understand and necessarily didn't have a good setup. But I really wanted to be able to make a big impact, bigger impact. So, you know, of course, this is like 2005 or something. Um, what are the top things in the field to be able to help at a higher level? ABA, positive behavior interventions and supports, right? So of course I worked hard to get into Vanderbilt because that is the place to be to study those things. So I came here and I learned and I learned so much. Well, in 2012, um, I landed in Metro Nashville Public Schools as a behavior analyst. So I was the BCBA on, on the behavior support team. Any BCBAs on that team in the room? There might be um, in the Zoom room, possibly, but definitely some that might have been formerly on that team. Um, but there, what? Yes. <laughs> What's up, Joey? <laughs> I think I met Joey before that in this program. I think I learned that. And now she's doing amazing things, obviously. But um, so now I was supporting in a primarily general education environment. Now I had like 15 to 20 schools under my domain. And of course, everything that comes across came across our business on that team were the kids with the most highly intensive behaviors. We're doing FBAs and BIPs and behavior analysis. And I'm seeing the same trend basically that I observed without having the words trauma informed that I observed back at, way back in teaching in that self-contained school. Not only were we not meeting their needs, these students, were coming from the most chaotic, unstable life experiences outside of school, far beyond what I had ever experienced myself, right? So I knew that <laughs> there's something there. Like obviously this instability in their home or community lives plays a role and we weren't meeting their needs. So then I saw this very same, same effect, not, now not only in my own classroom, you know, just my own 20 or 100 kids, however many I was serving in a given year, um, I was seeing it across all of these schools, right? And behavior analysis is a powerful tool, but really it's one tool amongst many other needs that these students may have um, that we might put into the category of social, emotional and behavioral health, maybe even delving into mental health, physical health as well. And um, so I, I discovered trauma-informed care um, a couple of years later and just was so it's, it was like a big aha light bulb moment like now what we're looking at here behavior analysis is a powerful scientific discipline but as joe mentioned before it, we are an early early young kind of discipline 
50 years old in comparison to many. I mean, attachment science existed there. I think you've heard about attachment science from Melissa McGee in some previous presentations, but that was a really soft science, right? We hadn't necessarily yet tied it to neurobiological science, the straight neuroscience or the physical, you know, medical science. But at this time, that's really emergent. And, and I learned about some of these things and it was a huge light bulb moment for me. Like there's a real intersection here where there's this converging body of strong scientific, scientific disciplines that might really inform the things that might work best for this population. So I wanna start being clear, this population, for me, I was a high incidence disabilities major. My whole career, education and career has been dedicated to kids with emotional and behavior disorders. Typically their um, typical IQ or even high IQ, right? We're not talking about intellectual disabilities or autism where a bulk of the ABA science is, right? And so I just saw for this population, you know, maybe there's some more integration we can bring in um, I shared this with Joe at a meeting a couple months ago, but something that was huge, fun, fundamental for me, I was very fortunate to start the doc program and Mark Woolery was here. So my first course in the first ABA sequence, he opened that course with a slide um, that said something to the effect of know your organism, right? So if you're working with an, uh, an individual who's diagnosed as autism or intellectual disabilities, you know, we're going to treat it as such. To me, I was, it was clear, like, this is another organism. And there's some biological science that really validates this. If we have trauma um, that's not just psychological, it is also in, in the tissues, in the body, um, and in the brain, then me, and also the you know that the typical IQ like we're this I, there, we might be onto something here that maybe we treat this organism a little differently and of course I'm not limiting to just you know I'm not like excluding other disabilities because I think when there's communication disorders and stuff sometimes they can't verbalize or communicate what's going on and they're actually at higher risk for being victimized or traumatized. So this is relevant across the board, but for me, that was big. And then when I started just uh, tapping into some of the trauma-informed science and talking at the national level and even the international level, like this was not an issue that was isolated to one classroom or one school or one, you know, MMPS or this is happening in schools, classrooms, children, homes, everywhere, right? This is a huge uh, magnitude issue. So put a fire under my belly, needless to say, and um, I consider it to be a huge privilege to be able to, to do this work and, and be one of many great, you know, good pioneers in, in trying to bring this forth. So um, I just wanted to take that minute to introduce myself and where I'm coming from um, before we jump in. But let me turn on the clicker. You may have to Podium because I'm not working. Yeah, it was working. Okay. I stand corrected. It's always tech. Okay. How about? Uh, I can I can look yeah. it for you if you want to cue me. Yeah, no worries, and I can kind of hang here too. Um, so we're gonna go through a quick review of multi-tiered systems of support. Y'all are experts on that. I won't take much time, but a quick review of the impacts of adversity and trauma. And then some of the ways that we might integrate social emotional learning and trauma-informed school practices into a multi-tiered systems of support or MTSS framework. Um, things like in incorporating multiple sources of data and interdisciplinary teaming, shared language and goals, um, and then teaching and integrating expectations. Um, a little commentary on some suggested interventions across the tiers and a focus on also adults, right? Adult wellness. Um, and then I wanna kind of uh, solidify some of the things we're talking about just by sharing our journey since about, I mean, the years are blurry, but really earliest 2010, but 2015 to today of how we've been able to bring, to integrate some of this work into our practices. Um, you can just, I don't know, it's a term, so it was. 
Oh, was. that was up. Was that you? We both did it. Try it again. Um, it was lucky timing. <laughs> Try one more thing. So, of I'll course, multi tiered systems of support, right? We can talk about that as a comprehensive school based intervention model. Is it working? Now? Yeah, it's okay. working. Um, to address varying student responses to intervention, right? So, it's a continuum of supports. We've got that primary level where we're working to prevent harm from occurring by teaching and reinforcing behaviors, that secondary level where we're working to reverse harm with um, lower intensity interventions for uh, small groups or uh, those students who need it, and the tertiary level, highly inter intensive interventions with the effort of um, uh, reducing harm. Um, so each level, this is really comes from a PBIS framework, but each level, of course, um, uh, has some core, core elements and are grounded in basic behavioral principles, right? Which is why ABA is such an important um, force to inform how we implement not only PBIS, but MTSS as a whole. So, you know, clearly defined expectations and reinforcement and prompting and uh, feedback and positive social interactions are all a really important part of that uh, system. Um, so, of course, at the primary level, we're integrating academics, behavior, and social emotional. So, academically, everybody's going to get, you know, high quality instruction. Um, uh, at behaviorally research based classroom management strategies. Um, and there may be some additional social, emotional, and behavioral supports that all students get in today's world that's necessary. Um, and then some social emotional practices. We do implement SEL curricula and even trauma informed interventions at that primary level, of course. Oops. So, of course, at the secondary level, academically, it could be small group interventions. Behaviorally, some of the same could be check in, check out, self monitoring, other secondary interventions. Um, we're utilizing something called advocacy centers that I'll talk about later. Um, and, you know, social, emotionally, small group counseling. We might integrate trauma specific interventions like a bounce back or cognitive behavior interventions for trauma in schools, um, which could also really be considered a tertiary intervention. Um, and then, you know, obviously tertiary level to really reduce that harm one on one, right? High, high intensive, high intensity interventions, FBAs and VIPs and safety plans behaviorally, um, socially, emotionally, again, could be mental health, could be some of those cognitive behavior interventions for trauma. Um, but ultimately, the integration is key, right? So as I hope that you are kind of convinced by Ms. Melissa McGee and others that provided the Building Strong Brains training, and then after our time together today, this is really critical. So social emotional health is not separate from behavior or behavioral health. Sometimes the lay person or the... Um, Kind of business as usual practices view like oh you're doing SEL right now oh that's a behavior intervention in fact um and joey can probably attest to this one but in mnps there's been a lot of conflating um there are some <laughs> i don't want to offend anybody <laughs> i wouldn't offend anybody in the room but i don't want to offend anybody in like my district but there was some conflating like oh it's all sel let's just keep that behavior thing to the side or the other, oh, it's all ABA, let's just keep that SEL thing to the side. And the fact is that how we're made, social emotional health is not separate from behavior. They're integrated, right? These things are not separate. So our ABA interventions need to be informed by SEL or SEL interventions the same, but, um, but let's take it to another level. Social, emotional, and behavioral health. Who's heard that term before? Social, emotional, and behavioral health. Yeah, that's now like a leading term in the MTSS world. They're integrated, social, emotional, and behavioral health. And we're not just talking social, emotional learning. We're talking about health, which learning is a part, of course. But social, emotional, and behavioral health is not separate from academic and school success. So if you've ever been an educator or worked for, right, teachers, um, we know, again, people don't always like the language I use about this, but there's kind of a power differential where curriculum and instruction or the academic side, they get the power, right? Because that's how we're measured. That's how teachers get tenured. That's how teachers get fired or paid. Or that's how school districts get ranked. But the fact of the matter is this is equally, if not, more important because if that foundation's not there, 
we're not going to have the academic success or the lifelong you know, success for our students. Um, so this is pretty critical, critical and a good time for me to segue into a little foundational understanding of um, uh, trauma informed the impacts of ACEs and trauma on neurobiological development, which I won't talk too much about, but thank you for entertaining me on really simple level MTSN information that you all probably know already really well, but just to set the stage here. So we've all seen this graphic before, right? Used in lots of different contexts and presentations, but it's just true. Um, what we see on the surface is just the tiniest little tip of the iceberg. There's so much more uh, that, that sets the stage for the behaviors or the characteristics that appear. So the underlying causes or influ influential behaviors that we don't see are, are just really important. And, and that is very true in the uh, trauma-informed world as well. So this is a graphic from Pace's Connection. You may or may not have seen this uh, in a previous presentation, but this is one of my favorite ones to show all of the ways that ACEs can happen. So raise your hand if you've heard of the ACE study before. Yeah, pretty much everyone. Good, love that. So the ACE survey that resulted in the ACE study, largest epidemiological study of our kind, uh, of our time, you know, first published in 1998, Generally, it kind of takes about 20 years for what happens in the research to trickle into real practice. That was right on track and it happened, you know, hopefully a little less, but 20 years later, everybody's like, oh, that ACE study was such a big thing. But that ACE survey really just focuses on what happens at the individual and household level. It's very, very narrow. So here, that's number one, that's the leaves of the tree, right? So we do have those 10 items um, abuse, neglect, household dysfunction that were in the original ACE survey, right? And those are very real, very important, but they are by no means the whole picture. And in fact, what happens at the individual and household level does not happen in a vacuum. It, it, the, the stage is set by the roots of the tree here. So adverse community environments, things like historical trauma, you know, opportunity gaps, right? Lack of access to a quality education, lack of social capital and, and mobility, um, substandard wager, wages or lack of access to you know, qual high um, wages or quality jobs, poor housing, of course, intergenerational trauma, systemic racism, um, what did I miss? Poor air and water, um, built, built structure, like lack of access to green space, parks in a neighborhood, food deserts, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, that sets the stage in many ways, not every single case, but in many cases for what happens at the individual and household level. And then this graphic also adds climate crisis, environmental um, adversity. So everyone in the world is no stranger now. We're in, you know, in the midst of a global pandemic. Um, and then also, so we could probably put COVID in here. And then of course, the impacts of climate change where we're seeing a whole lot more catastrophic weather related events. I mean, here in Nashville, for those of you that lived in Nashville in uh, spring 2020, we got hit by a deadly tornado, which just so happened to hit most of our, our you know, some of our highest poverty areas in Nashville, families who are already struggling, right? Um, and then we got hit with COVID. So we had some serious community trauma at that time, but um, all over the world, of course, um, climate crises are, are on the uprise and that impacts our kids too. I mean, we saw it a lot in the schools after that big tornado that when those sirens go off or there's a tornado warning, everybody's like reacting in a far more intensive way than they did before um, that really destructive one that went through. So. I also want to just comment really quick on discrimination and oppression and the many forms of uh, discrimination that can happen in our world, because I'll have this on a later slide, but well, let's just say it now. If it's not socially just, it's just not trauma informed. We can't talk about trauma informed care if we're not also talking about social justice. If it's not racially just, it's just not trauma informed. Um, I think historically some uh, trauma-informed care uh, efforts, noble as they are, might have missed this piece. And 
we can't. We we can't. Um, there's a great book, by the way, it's by Alex Binet. It's called Equity Centered Trauma Informed Education. I'd highly recommend that to anyone. Um, if you want to dig deeper on that this topic here. Um, but anyways, discrimina discrimination and oppression can occur in many forms. So it can be inter internalized, it can be inter uh, personal, systemic, historical. Certainly it can appear as implicit or unconscious bias. Um, it can appear in the form of little microaggressions that might be subtle. Um, it can also be overt discrimination, like overt racism. Um, or it can be covert in ways like tokenism or white savior complexes or cultural appropriation um, that may be implicit, right? Or, or unconscious, or, they, or, or there might be awareness around that. Um, of course, overt racism and other forms of discrimination occur. Um, obviously, racism is a huge one, and we can't just, you know, not be racist. We have to be anti racist as well. But in the same way, it's really important to acknowledge all of these types of forms of oppression. Um, what I'm kind of dancing around here is intersectionality, because every individual has the intersection of discrimination or oppression and privilege, right? We're all somewhere on the continuum for each thing. And it's not just one thing, right? We all have many characteristics that comprise who we are, some hidden, some on the surface. Um, but we really need to be able to explore the intersection of all the things that can happen. So um, racism, sexism, or, or misogyny, classism is huge, right? Classism is, is typically intertwined with oh, certainly racism, but all these other isms as well. Um, sexual orientation or gender identity discrimination. Um, ableism is a huge one. And that pertains, obviously, to the special ed department. Our students with disabilities can experience great dis dis uh, discrimination because of ableism in the world. And um, I've had a lot of stories from parents or situations that have happened in schools lately that really can impact some of those high incidence disabilities where a child might present as typically developing. That's fine. I can't see anything wrong with them, but they actually do have a diagnosis like ADHD, maybe like a sensory processing disorder. They present as a totally neurotypical kid, but there can be a lot of ableism there where, oh, this is just choice behavior, willful defiance, when in fact, there's a well-diagnosed, documented, known disability, but the layperson, which may even be, you know, the teachers and the education professionals, uh, Oh, it might be implicit, it might be not unintentional, but demonstrate ableism um, because they assume it's just choice behavior when it's not. Um, of course, ageism, that doesn't just talk about, uh, pertain to the elderly, it also pertains to kids. Ageism, again, you know, some biases in our world against children and what we expect or don't expect out of them. Um, that's a huge one. Um, of course, religious discrimination, national origin discrimination, or even xenophobia, which we've seen front and center in some uh, platforms in our country in the last uh, recent years. Um, basically, if you don't know, xenophobia is discrimination of, against anyone that's not like yourself. Uh, um, so again, if it's not racially just and socially just, it's simply not trauma-informed. That has to be a critical piece of, of this work. Um, so quick review of the ACE study. You all got this. I'm gonna only spend a second on this slide, but that really uncovered clearly. And then of course there's been many replication studies and, and continued work demonstrating the same effect over and over since the original publication in 98. But that showed this dose response relationship. Higher ACE score was um, highly statistically correlated with uh, higher risk for some really critical life outcomes. So higher risk for physical health problems, health risk behaviors, um, mental health problems, and diminished well-being and quality of life. I think we've heard this before. A couple important things I just wanna point out in case you didn't think about it the first time you, know, you heard about the, the ACE study. Um, one, this is correlational, not causational. Is correlational. So it doesn't mean I've got a high score, therefore I'm going to have, you know, decreased lifespan and those kind of things. Really, the important factor here 
is one main thing. I, feeling compelled to quiz you all here on what you got from that building strong brains training, but I won't do that. Um, it's the presence or absence of safe, stable, nurturing relationships and environments. It's the presence or absence of caring adults in their lives that can give them a hand up while that occur adversity is occurring. Because if we have that, even big adversities that we face are actually going to make us uh, primed to be able to be so much more. In fact, some have said, that suffering is even the only cause to be able to be even more, um, I don't know, for lack of a better word, brilliant, magnificent, like uh, rise above. So, you know, suffering can be a, a great, no, we don't wish it upon anyone, right? And that's really important. We don't want it to happen to anyone. But when it does happen, if we have caring adults who can give us what we need to make meaning of those life events to help us through, it can be a powerful thing. Though those things should have never happened in the first place, right? Like what happened is unnatural and not okay. Um, and symptoms of trauma are actually very predictable and um, biologically expected, biological impact, the uh, uh, known um, outcomes in the absence of those things. So we often talk about un unbuffered adversity and stress. That's what's bad, toxic stress, right? You heard that word, but I'm not gonna quiz you on that. Building strong brains. I'm sorry, all that to really set the stage for some of the emergent educational research here. So every time I copy and paste this slide, I forget to capitalize that D, so I gotta call myself out. <laughs> every time. <laughs> um, so Dr. Mark Brackett, he's the uh, director of the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. He recently wrote a great book that I'm not remembering the title of, but I'll cite it in a minute, in a few minutes as well. But he said the neural pathways in the brain are the very same ones that deal, uh, the neural pathways in the brain that deal with stress are the very same ones that are used for learning. So if we want our kids to, um, you know, achieve academically, or have school success, academic success in school, we, we, we simply can't do it if kids aren't emotionally healthy. And it's just such a powerful quote is supported by this converging body of scientific disciplines. Um, so the emergent educational research is showing a very similar effect, a very similar dose response relationship. Our students with higher A scores are also correlated with far higher risk for all of the things that we most traditionally measure in schools, which are what? What do we usually what measure for an education setting? Math and English. Yeah, academics, always math and English. What else do we measure? Attendance and discipline. Those are the three big buckets, right? Academics, descendants, discipline. So all of those, if we care about those things, even if we care about academics most, most, right? Like some teachers do. I just love math. I don't really know about the kids that much, but I love math and I want to instill this love for them, right? We still have to care about this. Um, so higher A score is correlated with higher risk for lower academic performance, language difficulties, um, both performance as well as standard, even standardized test scores and grades, um, behavior and discipline problems, challenges, relationships, social emotional problems, um, and attendance problems. So in one particular study, this is by uh, Dr. Mark Blage. He's out at the University, Washington State University. Um, um, he demonstrated that in comparison to, this is uh, upper elementary, uh, lower middle aged, I think it's like three to seven third seventh grade, um, in comparison to students with no known ACEs. And so now we're just narrowly looking at those 10 items on the ACE survey. And we're not looking at all the things can go, that can go wrong, by the way. So this is the most conservative estimate we could really find. But um, in comparison to students with no known ACEs, students with three or more are uh, three times more likely to experience academic failure, five times more likely to experience severe attendance problems, six times, maybe less surprisingly, six times more likely to experience uh, severe school behavior concerns and four times more likely to experience uh, somatic health complaints. My head hurts, my belly hurts, that cannot be otherwise explained by a medical diagnosis. Um, so pretty powerful stuff, right? Pretty powerful stuff that's really saying, yeah, we're on something here. 
we're on to something here. So this again is the other uh, Mark Brackett slide. Still, I'm not retrieving the name of his recent book, which is really good. You should read it. Um, but he, he, he shares stress, stress and stress and trauma um, can impact our ability to focus, kids ability to focus and pay attention, um, our decision-making ability to learn, our relationships and relationship skills, mental and physical health, and ultimately our, our ability to achieve not only the hopes and dreams and goals that say our teachers or our parents have set for us, but our own hopes, dreams, and, and goals. So this is pretty important, uh, pretty important. Um, so actually I'm gonna go here first. Um, has anybody ever seen the hand model of the brain before? Raise your hand if you have. I'm hoping not too many. If you see me, if you've seen me talk in a class or something, you've seen that, but I don't think it's included this way in the building strong brain. So I hope you wouldn't mind if I share it. So let's do it. This will this is just a model. Now I am not a neuroscientist. Um, I wish I was. Should have should have done dual program neuroscience as well because I love I love neuroscience. Now I just want to mention this is an oversimplification. If I were a neuroscientist, I'd, or if it was appropriate in this setting, which it's not, we could get a whole lot more technical about this. So this is just a, a, an illustration. But this is the hand model of the brain. So pretend. Well, first of all, we're going to do think lizard, mouse, monkey. So if you pretend your hand is a brain, right? This is your brain. Um, we all have a spinal cord, which gives messages from our body to our brain and uh, from our brain to our body. can't help myself here. I can't help myself from going off on this little tangent. Um, I'm going to talk about the brain here. This hand model is just about the brain, but it's not just the brain, y'all. In fact, we have three brains. Who's ever heard that before? That you have three brains. Actually, our gut... In our, in our heart, especially our heart, but both give more messages like those neurotransmitters, right? Those chemicals in our, floating through our brains, uh, more messages to the brain than the brain gives to them. So actually we really have three brains. So we're, what we're really talking about here is our nervous system. This is now bringing in like polyvagal theory. It's fascinating. Um, uh, but our whole nervous system, vagus nerve and you know, that connects our brain, our heart, and our gut is all um, integrated here. And in fact, in trauma-informed care, so to speak, in that world, we know that this is a whole nervous system thing. And when we interact, when humans interact, whether in a social setting like this one, all of us are in a shared room, or if it's one-on-one, -on -one, a teacher, student, or whoever, we're not, it's not just the observable stuff. It's not just the empirical stuff that's happening. In fact, one nervous system is talking to another nervous system. There's so much more chemically happening in our bodies um, and we are highly interdependent and interrelated. There is science also behind that. It's just a heck of a lot harder to measure. It's not so easy, easily empirically measured, but it is very real. Now, as a behavior analyst, I am highly trained, but I care about what's empirical, right? So let's stick with the neuroscience for the time being, though there is some science to demonstrate the other that I just mentioned. Um, but neuroscientifically speaking, before I jump back to the hand model, as educators, we don't have the luxury of having a kid's fMRI in their cumulative file, right? But if we did, we would see this is also highly empirical and uh, observable science. We just need some more highly precise, sophisticated tools, you know, microscopes, fMRI machines to, to measure that stuff, right? So it's not readily observable by the naked eye and a behavioral observation, which is like really compelling when we can have that, but it is empirical science also. So back to the brain. Um, Spinal cord, cool. But we all also have a brainstem. So right there in the media palm, this is referred to as like the reptilian brain. Um, lizards have it, just as we do humans. For lizards, kind of stops there. Um, so the 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 job of the brainstem is to keep us alive. So it's in charge of our physical safety and maintaining our physical um, life, keeping us alive. The brainstem is the dominant stage of development is in utero, as well as those earliest days and weeks of life. 
um, but the brainstem is fundamentally an important. So if we're walking through, this is like a super common metaphor, if we're walking through the woods, we're having a nice walk, we're cool, our lids down, because we're here, everything's functioning well, we're calm, happy, um, and then a tiger jumps out from behind a tree about to attack us, what are we going to do? What are you going to do? You're going to jump? Yeah. Right up. So you're going to jump, but just kind of flee, like run, get away. Freeze. You're going to freeze. I hope that tiger didn't see me, <laughs> right? Somebody else. Joe, Joe back there. He's like, tight down that, stick down that tiger. He's going to fight it, right? Um, but either way, are you going to stop and think before you jump or run or before you freeze or before you try to? No, there's no time. So some qualities of that brainstem. Um, one is that. Uh, it's highly reliable. It does not fail. In fact, that brainstem designed to keep us alive is also in charge of automatic functions in our body, things like breathing, digestion, a sleep alert states, things we don't even think about. It's highly reliable. Whoever made us would not have left it up to this thinker to breathe. How come? We would die. We would forget to breathe. But like we think this is the most reliable thing, unfortunately, especially us intelligent people that go to Vanderbilt, right? Like it's not the most reliable thing, but it's in our tissue. The brainstem is highly reliable. It does not fail. Um, the other quality of the brainstem is when it's engaged, it acts fast. It's reflexive. There's no time to stop and think and decide because we're going into fight, flight, freeze, or even fawn responses. Okay, so brainstem. Um, second. If you were to take, and this is where we get really simplified here because we could divide this up. But second, if you take your thumb, loop it over the brainstem, this is now your mid midbrain region. Things like the parietal lobes, the limbic system, the amygdala, and other things live right there in the middle of your brain. So mouse, uh, lower order mammals also have this part of the brain, um, just like us as humans. So the midbrain is also responsible for a lot of that stress response fight, flight, freeze, fawn. It's just that when the midbrain is engaged, it's more around relationships. It's around social or re relational safety, more so than protecting our physical life. Um, so emotional and relational safety can trigger the midbrain. Um, I have to share one other fun fact here. Right smack dab in the middle of that midbrain is your hippocamp hippocampus. Who knows what the hippocampus does? Yes, not. Say it again. I think I heard it right. I think I heard learning and, and memory, right? So a huge, I'm not sure, maybe. But that's okay. I'm not hearing it really. Yet. Um, so lots of it really has to do with our memory, ability to learn stored information, long-term memory, short-term memory. Right there, smack dab in the middle of our the emotional and relational centers of our brain. Like we can't tease it out. There's a really important concept called neural integration, which is referring to if one part of the brain is not working well, it's going to impact the ability of the whole brain to work, which I'll get to what I'll talk about last. But anyways, that's the midbrain. Lots of our fight, flight, freeze happens there just in, in a relation to our emotional or relational safety. Um, and we can have relational poverty in our, in our world, in our, in our kids or households or families or social dynamics, wherever that's probably actually far more detrimental than physical or material poverty, as long as basic needs are met. Now, if we don't have like a roof over our head, obviously material poverty is gonna really undermine development, but it's really rate relational poverty that can undermine, undermine development far more than material poverty. That's pretty important in this work. Um, anyways, I digress. So last, if you take your fingers, loop them over that midbrain, now here, this is the prefrontal cortex. Well, all of that is the cortex, but here's the sweet spot, that prefrontal cortex. Sometimes you might hear it called the neurocortex. That's where all things related to logic, thinking, reasoning live, and executive functioning. So the ability to integrate together all of the things happening around us and respond to our world in a functional, successful way. Um, so a lot, and so of course lizards have, I mean, sorry, uh, uh, monkeys have this part of the brain as do we, ours is just more advanced and evolved. Um, so that's really important. Now the punchline here is 
that which hopefully you got from the building strong brains training when we're exposed to too much unbuffered stress and adversity in those early years um say in utero or the first you know few months of life that's going to impact your brain stem your brain stem is going to get enlarged overly wired too much neural activity there so it's far more sensitized or prone to having a fight, flight, freeze response when triggers happen in our environment. Same during the stage of that midbrain development, which is still those early toddler, pre-K and early schooling years and that midbrain developing. When we're exposed to too much unbuffered stress and adversity during those years, our midbrain gets overly wired. Um, we're gonna be far more reactive and, and susceptible to uh, having a fight, flight, freeze response um, happening. So we're more prone to flipping our lid, right? So flipping your lid means um, you're in a dysregulated response. I can soon go back to, I guess, the last slide. But um, when we flip our lid, we're no longer operating here. In fact, it's like our uh, uh, prefrontal cortex prefrontal cortex is hijacked. We lose access to our prefrontal cortex and we're just operating either in the brainstem or the midbrain or you know, somewhere in the middle um, and we're in fight, flight or freeze mode. So what uh, a good, another good analogy for this would be um, our roads. So in a normal day, our roads are open, all of the cars are driving, maybe it's rush hour, everybody's getting where they need to go, things are functioning well, lots of cars on the road, um, cool. But what happens when there's an emergency vehicle, right? There's an ambulance and a fire truck racing up behind you. The normal usage of the road, everything has to halt. All those cars no longer get to access the road. It's an emergency hijacked because everybody has to get out of the way for those emergency vehicles. So that's kind of like what happens when our lid is flipped in a biological, very real physical happening. We can't access logic, thinking, and reasoning. So in the real world, what that can look like is we have a kid who knows I'm supposed to keep my hands and feet to myself. These are the school rules, blah, blah, blah. But maybe something happened. There was a trauma in the past that was associated with a loud noise. And then outside there's some construction and they have a blast. He's sitting in the classroom and this blast happens. It's unconscious. He doesn't even really connect the trigger, but the lid gets flipped and he flails and hits somebody or you know, topples a desk or throws it, whatever, because he's not accessing that logic and thinking, thinking and reasoning or the known you know, school rules and expectations we've taught in that moment. And it's not because it's willful defiance or choice behavior, it's because he flipped his lid and physiologically he's cut off from access to what he typically knows. Um, and that's so important. A uh, great video, which I considered showing y'all today, but I was like, no, it might not be research-based enough. So I can, um, it's called the Backwards Brain Bicycle, but what they, he was, it's engineers, watch it if you can, it's called the back, it's fun. Um, and it's not only about trauma, but it is about like neuroplasticity. Uh, what, they, he, what they demonstrate is that knowledge does not equal understanding or really ability to apply that skill across all contexts. So just because we know it or we've learned this fact, have wrote understanding, that doesn't mean that we're able to apply it in every context. And if there's a context where we flipped our lid, we're far less likely to be able to apply it. So this now starts to play into this slide, um, regulated versus dysregulated states. So this is adapted from like zones of regulation type of work. If you've heard about zones of regulation, it's acknowledging, like it's not just, oh, my lid's fully flipped or my lid's down, I'm operating in my learning brain. Kids talk about it as upstairs brain here. We wanna be in our upstairs brain so we can access our executive functioning and up uh, and, uh, our downstairs brain would be that brainstem and uh, midbrain, you know, where we're not at our optimal performance. But it, you know, it's kind of uh, a continuum here. So red would be full on in crisis. My lid's fully flipped. 
Um, some examples here, disability, stress, loss of function, could be panic attacks, nightmares, flashbacks, um, uh, fight, flight, freeze stuff, but it could be internalizing intrusive thoughts or suicidality, um, all kinds of things. And then of course there's thriving. That's the learning brain. That's the upstairs brain. Like I got this, I can um, navigate through frustration tolerance if I encounter a difficult task. I can handle more stressors before I um, lose it, right? And, and we're all susceptible to this. I mean, think about when you're hangry, right? Um, <laughs> it's huge. Like on a morning, say you're a teacher and this morning, you, everything went well, your alarm clock went off in time, your kids were really compliant and got ready and you got into school in time. So you got to work, you know, five minutes early so you could get hit that to-do list real quick before your kids arrive. And then your principal comes in to do an unexpected observation and you're like, that's cool. You know, I can handle this. And they pull you in and they give you some feedback and they sandwich it with the positive and they give you a bit of corrective feedback in the middle. And, and you know, you're all right. Like I can handle that corrective feedback today. That's cool. But think of a different day. This morning, your alarm clock didn't go off. Your kids got ready, uh, you know, on time exactly as they should. But then, as second you're getting in the car, the three-year-old says, "I got a poop," and you know, it, now it sets you back 20 minutes. And then you're on the way. Joey's back there nodding because we've been there. Woo. She's there right now. Probably hers are a little. Thank goodness I have adolescence now. I'm like, I'm good. But then, then you get in the car. The bathroom's done. You're running late. You're like, oh snap. And then your coffee goes all over your clothes. And so you're late. And um, then you're just after your ride, you just got there. Your kids were waiting with no teacher. Your principal pops in for an observation. You're like, oh, snap. You get through it. And then your principal calls you in the office for the feedback. And uh, you can't handle that corrective feedback in that moment because you had to, right? We all function differently. Um, here we're talking about allostatic load too, the baseline of stress that we all carry given what's going on in our life. So ultimately all to say context matters. The conditions that our kids are exposed to matter tremendously. And it's not just you know, psychological or choice. It is, is actually a very real physiological um, happening in the brain and body. Um, so we want to be able to keep kids in the green and when they get into the yellow or the orange, give them tools. Let me give you tools to calm yourself down. We need to be able to develop the capacity to state shift. In fact, I would go so far as to say our physiological state <laughs> determines our story. The narrative we tell ourselves. And if I'm hangry, I'm going to have all we, in fact, the normal brain, when all our needs are met, we have a five time negativity bias. Um, our brains are actually like uh, Teflon for the good and Velcro for the bad. We hang on to the bad stuff, that principle sandwiching. I gave you all this positive feedback, but one little crack, and we're going to harp on that one in a normal fashion. That's why the whole um, behavioral principle of you know seven or ten positives to one negative is like really really important that's based in some of this stuff super important um uh, but we have to be able to state shift when we start to get dysregulated we have to be able to detect it and have tools in our toolbox or learn skills to calm ourselves and dang, I didn't get to learn this until I was at least 35 and I'm still not super great at it today, despite the fact that I learn and study eat, breathe and sleep this stuff. I'm just like more aware of it, which is actually more painful. Like, dang, how did I get dysregulated? I'm supposed to be like the person that knows this stuff, right? Um, if we can instill this in kids today, how much stuff, how much, how many mistakes or how many, things can we prevent them from having to go through? And like if we instill this in kids today, that's a lifelong skill that will enrich their lives and really set them up for the utmost success. So um, I find this work pretty important. And uh, uh, executive functioning is really an important superpower one of you know, others, but a really important superpower that we've got to um, 
support. So we've got to be able to regulate people before we can possibly persuade them with a cognitive argument or compel them with an emotional affect, right? If they're in that brainstem mode um, or even that midbrain mode, we're not going to reach their cognitive brain. They're like, nothing's getting in, nothing's getting out. But sometimes if they're in a brainstem, fight, flight, freeze, like physical safety, we might not even be able to reach them relationally just yet. We've got to be able to help them get regulated first. So this is uh, Dr. Bruce Perry's uh, imaging. He um, uh, has the NeuroChild Institute. Um, he has the neurosequential model certification for clinicians and then for educators. He's got a neurosequential model for educators. It's really good work that can happen in classrooms and schools. Um, there are many others that do similar work. The Institute of, uh, International Institute of Restorative Practices has some similar framing. Dan Siegel has some similar framing, but Bruce Perry says first regulate. First, we've got to get physiologically regulated. Could be through some uh, mindfulness-based movement or breathing or somatic practices. Um, then, then when we're physiologically re regulated, we can connect in relationship, we can relate. Right, And then only when we're regulated and connected, now we can get through reasoning, get to reasoning in that cognitive piece. So in the great words of Bruce Berry, heading straight for the reasoning part of the brain won't work if a child is dysregulated and disconnected um, from others. So moving on, what are some uh, qualities of integrating trauma-informed school practices into an MTSS framework. And by the way, a lot of this is pulled from some of the PBS science that is, you know, not even of today, 20 years or more old. But we need effective teaming. That's huge. I uh, just stepped out of the room, but I just super applaud that he's focusing on interdisciplinary teaming, particularly with PCBAs, because we haven't always been great at that. Um, I'll comment a little more about my trauma-informed schools team that I lead later, but we are doing it in the real world. We are an interdisciplinary team, and in some ways it's harder. There can be more things that come up, but if when we get it right, we're capable of so much more because we're bringing all the tools that are needed. So that um, effective teaming, right? Uh, another side note on this as it pertains to teaming, when we're talking about collaborative work, which I mean, most roles, certainly all the roles that we're all studying to go into or are currently into, teaming is a part of our work, right? Nobody can fix any of the issues we're trying to fix alone. We we're better together. Um, there's no I in team. Sorry to be corny, right? But we are teaming. Dysregulated teaming is a very real thing. So we can get dysregulated individually, flip our leg or not. But man, my nervous system's talking to your nervous system. Oh gosh, I'm gonna get really nerdy here. But now I'm talking about social contagion theory. Social, contag social things are contagious. There's some compelling research out right now actually about social media. I just heard this one on like NPI or something. Let me think if I can get this right. What, uh, well, let me back up a little bit on social contagion theory. So there are some really compelling mapping illustrations where violence is contagious. Um, violence actually mapped out shows a very similar pattern to pathological contagions, like something like a COVID epidemic. Um, there's, yeah. So, so, and there is a, another great study, social contagion theory in the classroom. Um, sorry to be kind of nerdy, but I, this is just like really interesting in this work. So this, I could send it to you if y'all want it. The social contagion theory in the classroom article showed, basically they took teachers, it was early elementary. Um, they took teachers and had them fill out burnout scales. So they had a burnout rating. And then they took these, I think it was like first, First graders, it might have all been first graders, but early elementary, they had them spit in a cup, like a test tube, at um, immediately upon arrival to school. I think it was like 45 minutes after arrival, and then again later in the day. And what they have found is that, and then of course they looked at behavior in the classroom too, but what they found is that the cortisol levels in the student spit was statistically significantly you know, correlated with teacher burnout level. 
So kids with higher cortisol, obviously the stress hormone, right? Um, kids with higher, students with higher cortisol um, were far more likely to have teachers that had higher levels of burnout. So whose fault is that? Did the teachers burn out? They were being mean to kids, cause their cortisol to go up, or did the kids bringing stress to the classroom cause the teachers burnout? I'm not sure. I'm not sure the directionality of that relationship. Um, and that particular study wasn't didn't use statistics, but showed that. But um, social contagion theory is very real, including things like violence. And the social media study that was just demonstrated was really interesting. Um, and I'm not going to be able to, it, again, it was a news report. So I don't know what the scientific study, the level of rigor behind that was, but it was a, a scientific publication. But what it showed is that in communities, I think it was international too, it wasn't necessarily here in the US, if I remember correctly, but communities who had higher Facebook usage um, had higher rates of assault against uh, minoritized groups. It was like, I think it was kind of an anti-Muslim acts of violence. And so they were showing this fairly preliminary evidence of, of these correlations. And working in schools, y'all, like it's real. The ways social media are impacting our students' behavior, we cannot underestimate that. And here the technology is, is far behind the real world socially, um, yeah, the cultural, cultural happenings, so to speak. Um, on that note, just because I can't help giving the commentary on you know, trauma and the some high level repercussions of it. And I should have said this on that PACES connection slide, but right now, I mean, it's undeniable that we're in a world where there is some collective trauma at play, right? So we have direct experiences of trauma that might, we might have been directly impacted with. And then there's known vicarious trauma, right? It might be caregivers or helping professionals that are working directly with highly traumatized individuals that, that have symptoms, develop symptoms of trauma, but they didn't directly experience the event. So our world today, we've got both going on. Many, many people have direct experiences. Um, some of us might never have gotten, say, COVID or had a family member die, or maybe we haven't been victimized by racism or other things. Um, although with the many forms of discrimination, there, you know, this is a continuum. Um, but the thing is on a large scale level, sometimes collective trauma looks like culture. That's huge. We've got a lot of, students and families, even um, adult professionals in, in MMPS, who you could ask them, hey, have you experienced trauma? And maybe it's a, a close relationship, you're connected, they trust you, their safety, they, they would answer honestly. And they're like, no, what are you talking about? I don't have trauma. But then if you start asking questions, you know, have these things happened? They're like, oh yeah, that, that, that. But that's just normally, normal. That's just, right? That's just life. So some groups more than others, but some may not experience, uh, relate to this as trauma because it's so highly normalized. And we've got whole schools that fit into that category in, in many respects, like community violence or, or gang uh, behavior. Is that, you know, that, that's, just, that's just how it is. That's not trauma. So sometimes collective trauma can present as culture not defining our culture as a whole, but aspects of, of culture. So anyways, back to MTSS framework, but, but effective teaming is so critical, so critical in this work. Of course, we're gonna be data, have database decision-making. Um, we're gonna have formal processes for selection of, and implementation of evidence-based practices um, about trauma-informed practices. I wanna quickly comment sometimes, trauma-informed practices are generally based on uh, like say component analysis or derived from evidence-based um, science. However, we may be sometimes working with evidence-informed practices as well. And here now I'm really talking about a very um, high-level definition of evidence-based practices that you all are well-schooled in. 
like you know how we evaluate an evidence-based practice in single subject design versus methodology like y'all know that so just that distinction here sometimes I'm, i you know i might use the language of evidence-informed practices because i know to be evidence-based has a high level of um uh, specificity but yeah screening of course um, progress monitoring, coaching for, for uh, the practices that we implement, both systemically and individual practices. Um, so when it comes to MTSS, it really should include one single MTSS team um, in my district. We call it MTSSB for SEL and behavior, and then MTSS is for academics. So we want to have one integrated team as much as possible, certainly for SEL and behavior but preferably with academics too, because you can't separate those things, right? We've got to be looking at all the different data indicators at one table. That's really important. We want to incorporate multiple sources of data. Um, we want to have menus of available interventions so we can really tailor interventions to the needs of a student. Again, this is kind of back to the basics. But we want to teach and integrate trauma-informed and social-emotional learning expectations maybe into our PBIS expectations if we're using PBIS. Hopefully y'all are still calling it PBIS here, right? Our state and district is funky. They call it RTIB, which kind of <laughs> gives me some of I like PBIS, so you know what I'm talking about that. Let's get our semantics right. Um, we want to look at our implementation fidelity, right? If we want to monitor, is this effective? We want to make sure it was implemented with fidelity, of course. And then we've really got to focus on our adults, too, our ability of our, our health and wellness of our adults um, to ensure, to optimize uh, not only social validity and buy-in, buy but also their ability, right, to implement evidence-based practices so we can get a higher implementation fidelity. So here's an illustration. This comes from, you know, the uh, PBIS Center through OSEP. Um, so to integrate a trauma-informed approach into a PBIS framework, and this can just help fuel that MTSS framework as a whole, first we're looking at the data, of course, right? What does the data say? We're incorporating these multiple sources of data. And then we're identifying, you know, what the concerns are, database decision making. Um, and then of course we wanna uh, draft and be very clear on our SMART goals that, that are specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and uh, time bound, right? Of course, we're all well versed on that stuff. Um, the next step is to look at um, what, what we're going to do to support behavior or the need that's arising based out of the data um, that is also giving kids the necessary skills to be able to re regulate their emotions and behavior, right? That's really important, taking into account that this is deeper than just what can be empirically observable. We also have to consider regulation, which inherently informs us to also ensure that we're considering relationships and relationship-rich environments. Um, and we're applying a trauma-informed lens, right? Trauma-informed lens is growth-minded, strengths-based. It's not about what's wrong with you. Instead, it's considering like, what are the context and conditions that our kids have been exposed to, not only now in the current settings, but also historically. Oh, I was gonna say this before on the hand model slide. Dr. Bruce Perry has shown, he's a leading child uh, trauma, he's a psychiatrist, he actually lives in Tennessee now, but he, he's a fascinating researcher as well as a practitioner, lifelong practitioner. He has some solid science to show um, that the most critical time point for being exposed to trauma with the longest acting effects, life, longest lasting effects, are the first two weeks of life. I can't remember if it was two weeks or two months. It might've been two months, so don't quote me on that one. But whoa, that is so counterintuitive to the way our society thinks about it. Our society thinks, oh yeah, the baby was there. I can, I, God, like I do, I've done trauma work for too long because the example is coming up in my head. Like, you don't even want to hear me say, like, I'm going into like a murder scene and that kind of stuff. So I'm not going to say that. But the, this baby exposed to this really horrible thing, the baby's fine because they weren't, aren't going to remember what happened. The science shows otherwise. Um, I personally am a product of that, actually. 
and it's been really eye-opening for me as I struggle with you know, some of my own, like, whatever. I mean, I'm pretty high functioning and a happy person generally, but I do struggle with anxiety, depression, you know, some, you know, <laughs> suffering is, is a path of mine. Uh, I was born with a um, undeveloped stomach. Um, I wasn't supposed to be a preemie, but apparently I was, I guess they got the due date wrong or the conception date wrong or something. And so I spent the first few months of my life screaming and my parent, you know, they did their best, but especially I'm old. So especially 45 years ago, like there probably were times where they're like, and they traveled and they tell me the story of, um, my grandma took care of me during that time. I screamed my head off the whole time because I had this underdeveloped stomach. And when I got home, she was like, take this child. So God knows what happened to me. But um, I wasn't abused or neglected. And they, I think they did their very best to meet my needs. Um, the doctor offered painkillers and my parents declined it, which I'm glad they did. This probably the effects of that might have been different on a tiny little newborn baby. But either way, coming into the indigenous populations, say one of the most important things when a baby is born is to have a really calm environment and so they come into the, in love into a world of love and happiness and joy so there is something to be said about that anyways I digress but what happens to us at very early years can actually get um deep in our tissues not that it can't be remedied right it can always be healed we just have to be aware. So it's not like there's lost hope, but what happens at a very early age can really impact what happens in middle school or high school or even later. And we're so detached from that in the business as usual world. Um, and that's sometimes where some of that discrimination comes from. I had one parent come to me not long ago that was like, my child has a disability. I really try, I taught, the, like it's diagnosed, it's clear. Um, I tried to tell the school this, but it happened at an earlier age, it's, but it's totally effect, affecting their functionality now. And they couldn't see it. The school could not see it. They could not see it. And it ended up, man, it, was, it wasn't even bad behavior, by the way. It was truancy. The child couldn't come to school because of anxiety related to the trauma. And then there were some things happening at school, like bullying kind of things. And the parent was like, you can trauma, like help, help. And they wouldn't, and they actually had a manifestation determination for uh, truancy and the whole team, nope, not a manifestation, nope, not despite medically doc documented trauma and stuff. And like, it does just broke my heart a little bit because, oh, that happened a long time ago. Why is it impacting today? But it is, it, it is. And, and we've got to like start to see and look deeply and understand that, particularly with our students. Oh not particularly for any group, but I was going to say particularly with our students with IEPs or with well-documented stuff. Um, so that trauma-informed lens, right? That's what I'm touching on here. We've got to be able to see kids with a trauma lens. Um, how do we teach staff the knowledge and necessarily sk necessary skills? How do we implement with fidelity? And one way we can do that is through professional learning communities and promoting um, widespread awareness. So now, um, I've told some stories here, right? But I want to jump into kind of our storyline, our journey in MMPS. Um, I'm kind of going to jump through years a little bit in an effort to tell a chronological story here. But if you're not familiar with MMPS, we are like a whole city in ourselves. We've got today, it's a little fewer, a little lower than this. Um, today, I think it's hanging around 82 to 83,000 students. Um, uh, 167 schools, that count uh, includes charters. So we've got 152 MNPS specific and then the rest are affiliated charters. Um, uh, three quarters, yeah, I think it's 76% of our district are considered minoritized uh, populations. Um, and so the remainder being white, that also includes like our Kurdish students and our Egyptian students. So they may not necessarily be that Eurocentric white, they still might be newcomers to our country. We represent 130 plus, more than 130 countries in the district and about a quarter of our students are English language learners and our economic disadvantage rate, that's again low. Right now it's hanging around 76%. Of course, that number is a little less precise today since they no longer require 
the same documentation for free and, and reduced lunch. So, you know, but 76% are considered economically disadvantaged. So highly diverse, brilliant, beautiful, but also very high needs school district. And then of course was COVID and racial and social justice stuff. I like it's all gone exponential. The needs have been deeply amplified. And of course the pandemic and other things in our world have most certainly disproportionately impacted our students who already uh, came in with unmet needs in some form or another, right? Uh, through say COVID and shutdowns and virtual learning. Some kids got to go fewer, not as many, but um, some kids got to go through that on a beautiful yacht with you know, the perfect desk and computer and the stay-at-home mom who could act as the virtual instructor and the snacks and all the things. Most of our students did not have that set up. Some didn't even have a lifeboat or an umbrella to weather the storm, right? It's a disproportionate impact, but instructional framework. So this is some years back, MMPS uh, uh, identified an instructional framework where, um, to get outcomes, we're looking at problem solving and questioning and academic feedback and thinking, but it's all framed through ambitious pedagogy, right? Um, ambitious high level learning opportunities for all kids, equitable pet pedagogy, so everyone gets their needs met, not one size fits all, and then integrating SEL into the academic cur curriculum. And it's all framed with high expectations and accountability distributed leadership. In fact, now um, we're really working to uh, um, equip leaders at all levels. So it's not just leadership. Students are very much leaders and families. Um, positive culture and uh, what did I miss? I think that was all of them. So that's our instructional framework. Um, so our school conditions, we're really wanting to promote high expectations. Um, again, reciprocal, these are just definitions, reciprocal accountability, leadership, and positive culture. I don't want to take a lot of time on that. But we, so some years back, I think that this data is coming from like 2016. So I just picked that year because that was a time. So in 2010, we really started recognizing the need for more enhanced or robust social, emotional, and behavioral uh, health type of supports. We brought in a collaborative referral process. Um, and you know, employed folks like behavior analysts and, and that kind of thing around those years. Um, but in 2016, we're now diving deeper, really look, looking at, we've always looked at data. So don't take this, that's where I'm like, I'm skipping through years, but trying to tell a chronological story. But we were really digging deep now. We were starting to do the trauma work, uh, originating in 2014, 15, but it's now picking up a lot of steam. So we really wanted to look at the data to provide a compelling reason and rationale as we were you know, trying to advocate for more funding to be allocated to some of these areas like social, emotional, and behavioral health, whether it was local school district operating budget or um, Metro Gov, you know, Metro Council, Mayor's Office, city money. Um, so we looked at our reading or our academic scores, of course, because it's an integrated MTSS system. We've got to look at all of the data sources we have access to. So there we found that 35% of our kids were at high risk on the progress monitoring. By the way, this year we stopped using that. We're now using FastBridge. So a little outdated, but 35% um, of our kids were below the 25th percentile in reading or grades two, two through eight. So only 42 um, percent were at low risk and at, you know, performing where we wanted. Um, math was even a little worse, right? Uh, suspension, of course, behavior data is really important. Looking at suspension and expulsion data at that time, um, less than 1% of our kids had been expelled or remanded, um, but 8.5% had been suspended. That's a pretty high percentage. And if we're putting this into an a, um, MTSS framework, right, where we want only three to five percent kids at high risk or 10 to 15 at moderate risk. Like, where are we there? Um, 18 percent had a discipline infraction that resulted in like a, a behavior, a discipline referral, right? So have some growth there. Oh, on behavior, I also want to comment. I know that I didn't share data for it here, but 
we've been since probably 2010 for about a decade or more we've been a passage affiliated district i've been involved with that for many of these years but um that stands for positive and safe schools advancing greater equity so specifically trying to interrupt discipline disparities where our um, historically marginalized students typically black males being the most uh, disenfranchised or at risk um, brown males would be next, black females, um, where our minoritized students uh, were far more likely to experience um, high, highly punitive discipline, suspensions, and expulsions than their white counterparts. So in fact, we have done take great, and by the way, this is not just an MMPS problem. This is consistent with national trends. Um, we've actually done some really great, had some really great gains in reducing overall discipline numbers from, say, the, what you see here in 2016-17, and really great strides. We have not interrupted the discipline disparities still. So that's still continuing work and critical, critical work that's taking place. Um, so yeah, attendance, again, 56% um, of kids were where we wanted to be 20% would be what we consider um, very high risk red flag kids, chronic absenteeism, right? Um, so that's, whoa, that is way too high. So some good and we're, a lot of improvements to that data I'm sharing here. So please don't like cite the data, look how bad MMPS is because we've made some good gains, but these are some of the numbers we were using to inform. We also have a, an SEL walkthrough, um, uh, the director of social emotional learning has been instrumental in collaboration with CASEL, the collaborative for academic and social emotional learning, some grants and collaborative work with them. So going into classrooms and it's just totally snapshot data. It's totally snapshot. It's definitely not like deep dive data, but snapshot data, these pop in drop into classrooms using a rubric. How are we performing on SEL? And you know, here you're not seeing like the domains or the actual items, but basically the gist is we were looking at this data and saw some big areas of growth, right? Big ones, uh, student voice has been uh, over the years, like pretty low. We need to elevate student voice and that kind of stuff. Um, we also use Panorama for school culture and climate. So there are a student report, there's parent, family report, parent report, family report, and then there's teacher self report. Um, so again, seeing this, these are the percent favorable. So with academic uh, pressure, 70, only 77% reported that that's favorable. School engagement, only 43% reported favorably on school engagement. 46% um, trust and caring environment. I mentioned student voice, that was still hanging at 49. 47% school safety. Like 53 of our, 53% are saying they don't feel safe at school. Like, mm, we got some real growth areas here, right? So we continue to measure school culture and climate. And every year that I've been around, it gets emphasized more and more. Um, but we're, we're working to move the needle. So I'm not going to continue going through. But additional sources of data, we looked at the numbers of collaborative referrals. You know, what were the number of students being that had been had needs identified through an MTSS teaming process? Um, collaborative referrals for mental health providers, social workers. What behavior analysts? Yeah, shout out y'all, right? Who's being referred to behavior analysts? Um, later, trauma informed specialists. Um, other other specialized providers. Um, we have uh, suicide screeners. Who can I just tell you? Suicide screeners, threat assessments, bullying uh, assessments. Those have gone up exponentially since COVID. But we're looking at those numbers. What students have been referred for suicidality and self harming behavior? Um, community. Here we were more anecdotally looking at community violence and oh, student deaths. Oh my gosh. Oh, yeah, our crisis response, like we can't even do our normal jobs because every single day included, every single day we're being called to respond to a thing because people are more aware and now they're like, okay, you know, collective trauma is culture, but now I'm seeing this is collective trauma, I need help, come in and somebody support me because this big thing happened. So that's a good sign, but we need a whole district team who their whole job is just to be available for these immediate urgent things that come up that we're, you know, you can't uh, predict them. 
but now it's happening so much that we can predict that they're going to be there. Um, uh, I'll talk about handles care in a minute too. That's another source, but threat assessments. And then I talked about passage, so our discipline disparity data. So here's handles care. So um, this is a proud point for me, but um, through the trauma informed schools initiative, yeah, the first year that we implemented it was fall 2017, large scale. We just well, yeah, we went we went big or went home. So we didn't start with we talked about starting with a pilot, but then when we got to start it, we just no, we're going to go whole district. But handle with care um, is it comes out of West Virginia. It is a partnership between a local education a school district and a local police department. Um, there was a lieutenant. Now she's a deputy chief. She's super inspirational. She's the kind of the deputy chief for women that um, doesn't ask for permission, but asks for forgiveness later. And she's done some incredible work with the police department, bringing lethal lethality assessments is one of her big gains, um, which is a victimization, a predictor of how likely a domestic abuse victim is to be killed. So that they can you know get protective orders of protection and that kind of stuff. But the other big one that she uh, discovered and worked to bring to the school district was handle with care. So handle with care, and then to and so they were, there was interest. But then when I met her, I was like, we're going to do this. Like I'm going to make this happen. It took me a minute. It took me about a year to get those approvals, but then I got the go ahead to do it. So we've been implementing it since 2017. What it is though, it is a collaboration between the um, local police department and the local school district. So the police department's role is just on a daily basis to send me and, and my team just the demographic information, just the names and birth dates of students who have been who have witnessed or been well, school aged children in Davidson County who have been uh, witnessed to or victim of some sort of potentially a traumatic event in the community that results in a police report. So to be very clear, these are not potential instigators or someone that did something that they shouldn't have done that results in it. Instead, these are witnesses or victims. Every child on this list is with. Now we get no detailed information about the event. We don't know what the event is. We don't need to know what the event is. That's a really important um, element of trauma-informed care, particularly for like a teacher level and not a um, mental health provider. We do not need to know the details or the ins and outs Think back to the iceberg graphic. We don't need to know what's all below the iceberg. Um, we just need to know there's something going on in this, and then we can support them in a, all students in a trauma-informed way because we know there's something there, and then there's some maybe behaviors or emotional dysregulation that so they have a need. So we don't have to share. We don't. We don't even know. We don't want to know what happened. Um, but then in turn, it's a notification system by design. It's designed to prevent kids who need support from falling through the cracks. It's designed to enhance access to evidence-based interventions or evidence-informed interventions that kids need. So we're not missing kids who need it, particularly those internalizers, right? Where there might not be obvious things on the surface. Um, perfectionism, that's fawning, if y'all don't know that. It's not just fight, flight, freeze. There's also fawning. I might be overly compliant, perfectionistic. Um, because of my trauma, more so than is good for me, right? And um, the logic behind that is if I'm victimized, it is a um, response that helps keep me safe or even an adaptive coping strategy. If I'm compliant and do what my abuser says, I'm less likely to get hurt as bad, right? So that then can become overgeneralized and somebody can fawn or be really highly perfection. And so they might look on the outside like the perfect student, right? But the inside, there's a lot going on. Bless you. Um, so Handle with Care is designed to make sure we're catching kids. So these are just the numbers. Anyways, it's a notification system by design. So then we notify the school administrator social worker and we encourage them to share that information with the teacher adult who spends the majority of the time with kids um, so that we make sure that they get access to either the classroom level supports or all the way on up to a clever referral when they need it whatever is needed so um yeah there's our numbers again about an 83,000 uh, per student school district and year to year 
And you notice the trend there, year to year increase. Not sure if it's more events happening or if it's the police department getting better at making sure that they list witnesses or victims on all the police reports, but clear year to year increase we're seeing. Um, so that's interesting work that we do, but we looked at that data as well. So student voice data too. Um, this is a little later, but holding student voice sessions, like really, what are they saying they need? So where we're seeing students wanted teachers that seem to care about their lives after high school and not just look at them as a chance. This is, I mean, this is out of the mouth of the babes. This is like what Ken's actually said, not just as, you know, I got a job to do, you're in the way, or, you know, uh, they weren't just trying to advance themselves. They want to really support kids. Students feeling as if there weren't opportunities to get to know a teacher unless they were involved in, involved in extracurricular curricular activities or expanding on that. Some kids saying like, I'm not just a test score, even if I'm not a high performing academic student, like, why are you not noticing or caring about me? Um, teachers giving up on students that are not doing as well. Loud sigh. <laughs> Still working on that. Right? The kids that don't fit the mold. You know, maybe, but let me not generalize a group, but those who aren't trained to deal with differentiated needs. Even those who are trained, y'all. I mean, we see this in special ed teachers. It's like, what? Anyways. Um, teachers who can play favorites and the students feel like they're looked down upon, some teachers seeming to not care about helping them. These are just student perceptions, whether factual or not. It, again, another big concept in the trauma-informed world, we can't judge the event itself. We, I mean, we can, but we got to be careful about saying, oh, but that teacher wasn't really that way or that event really wasn't that traumatic, or why you, you two sisters, you experienced the exact same thing, you're in the same house, why is this sister fine? That means this sister, I mean, this sister is not fine. Like, it's just because you're bad or you didn't write it. It's not about the event itself. It's far more about the experience of that event. You ever heard, or heard like a meaning norm, like intent versus impact? Be aware of intent versus impact, or biblically speaking, um, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? You've heard those adages type of things, but right, intent might be one way, it might be unintentional or implicit, but if it impacts somebody in this way, that matters, and we have to validate or honor that, make sure that they're first regulated, then connected, and then we can maybe talk through like, Let's think about just the fact that that person maybe didn't intend to impact you that way. Does that matter? Like then we can really reflect or explore that. But first we've got to have safety and trust, connection and regulation and all that. Because I'm not saying intent doesn't matter, but impact matters a whole lot. We can't underestimate that. Um, so, and kids still today, we want more every time we do student voice sessions because they're like, we need more of this. Let us, we're not, yeah, our voice uh, teacher talk time, as I stand up here with all the talk time, teacher talk time far, far exceeds um, student talk time, right? And we need to keep working on that because kids really need and want their voice to be heard. That's an ageism bias too. Um, that is an ageism bias, right? Um, all right, so now, all this data, right, in an MTSS framework as we're trying to do the work and the real, the hard work in the real world, um, a clear need emerged. And clearly, yes, in an MTSS model, we've got tier one, tier two, tier three, all levels are needed. But when it comes to trauma-informed school practice, a clear need really emerges. We needed to strengthen our integrated MTSS system at tier one um, in a trauma-informed way. So here we're integrating social emotional learning, we're integrating some of those behavioral approaches like PBIS, and we're integrating that academic pedagogy um, that is attentive to those social emotional and behavioral health um, and how that interplays. Uh, definitely still working on the curriculum and instruction piece to give us an equal seat at the table, right? Uh, but what does it mean to be a trauma-informed school? And this is where I do have a handout, but I'm not sure if I have enough to, for everybody. I think I printed 55. I don't know how many are in the room, but at least we can. How about I put them in the back? Yeah, the so if you want to pick it up on the way out, that's a perfect idea. Thank you. 
Um, so anyways, a, a trauma-informed school or classroom or individual, however we want to district, there's a deep emphasis on safety, but not just physical safety. We're also talking about that relational safety. It's huge. So all kids can feel safe, not only physically, but relationally, emotionally, behaviorally. That's a big one. When behavioral mistakes happen, is that safe? Am I gonna use, are my adults gonna use discipline to teach and not necessarily punitive exclusionary discipline? That's like really, really important. Um, in an ABA lens, this can come up a lot with the use of extinction or planned ignoring by the late, but that can be really misapplied in a way that damages. And we gotta be very careful about that to not ignore the child. Yes, we can use extinction and ignore the behavior, but being very careful, we're not ignoring the child. And we're never ignoring, of course, in an ABA lens. So don't think I'm um, dogging anything at all. I'm not. But extinction is one to be really careful about. So we're not um, re traumatizing. Um, behavioral safety. Another comment I'll make about behavioral safety might come in the form of high intensity um, behaviors that might have an imminent threat of harm to self or others for which say a safety plan might be needed when we're talking about that escalation cycle for those of you who have received you know, training on say non-violent crisis intervention or something like that or even safety plans of uh, behavior intervention plans ABA practices um, that might move <laughs> If we're talking about behavior that's about to really go to full on flipped lid, red zone, full on crisis, if there's a true threat, threat of harm, what's the goal of de escalation? <laughs> the goal of de escalation is to interrupt that problem behavior so it stops, so that harm doesn't happen. Um, sometimes, from an ABA lens, we can do things like maybe extinction procedures. Um, there's a couple comments I'd say on this, but if it's really moving towards a safety concern, our goal needs to be to bring that behavior, to interrupt that behavior and bring it back down. That may not be the time to use the regular behavior intervention plan protocols that might incorporate like some extinction procedures or something, or even certainly physical holds that, uh, you know, because that might escalate the behavior more. And then leading to the need for something like a physical hold that otherwise could have been presented if we prevented if we connect with the child with some compassion or at least social uh, connection. So I'm not, I'm not trying to throw anything out, but I am saying if we're really going to a crisis level behavior, we've got to be, that may not be the best time to use some strategies that are gonna allow, and, and here we're talking, we can get into um, functional analysis as well too, right? Where we're instigating. So here I'll comment, and this is like pretty surface level because I am not specifically giving an ABA in trauma presentation. I think there are other experts here that I understand at Vanderbilt that have that expertise, which I'm excited to hear about, hear, learn more about. But um, another thing I'll say there about extinction, um, procedures that oh, I'm losing my train of thought. Sorry, but I got caught up in thinking of another um, research strand. Um, we've we've got to, hold on, I've got to get it back. Ah, thanks. Functional analysis. Yes, thank you. From a neuroscientific perspective, thank you so much. That's the worst when you're having a group and you like lose it. Yeah. Hasn't anybody before? I see a couple yeah. like, oh, <laughs> thank you so much for bringing. So from a nearest, okay, repetition, where our brains are plastic, repetition is so powerful, which is where things like discrete trials, ABA has so much to offer in this arena because we can have, when we can have repetition of positive social inter interactions as well as skill acquisition, um, man, that is powerful, transformative. But when it comes to something like functional analysis, we and functional analysis is meant to just be a couple trials that we're instigating, so that's okay. But if we're talking about over and over again in a behavior intervention plan kind of context, we're also talking about wiring neural pathways. So if a kid is 
if we've evoked a high intensity behavior flip lid dysregulation response, we're far more likely to evoke that same response again, because this is now becoming a well-trodden neural pathway from a biological perspective, right? So I'll leave it, I'll leave it at that, but so yeah, I, please, please. I have a question. Yeah. You said earlier in your, in your talk that uh, instruction that happens when we activate does not generalize, for instance, like where, like, so instructions. So like anything that's happening in a um, is not really being activated or relevant to your medical life scenario. Because, because not, the, emer the emergency vehicles are on that. Okay. Right. We're hijacked access to that, right? The, the purpose of instruction is to like, Increase the skill set of our emergency team, like the people who are driving for When does that, what is an appropriate context for teaching that if not in a slightly less? Right. I think that hits it right there. It is highly appropriate in a slightly escalated context. In fact, that's a powerful window of opportunity. It's just not so appropriate when the whole roads are shut down and emergency vehicles. I love how your brain is like taking the <laughs> metaphor to a next level. Like the practitioners that are the emergency vehicles, right? Turn there. But no, I, if I went back to that graphic, the zones of regulation, the red, uh, yellow, orange, yellow, green, I would say that the orange and the yellow are powerful windows of teaching opportunities. But if we're now in the orange where we're headed to the red, we might want to back off to not escalate it all the way to the red. That would be, I think, my quick answer to that. Um, so at this stage, I mean, I can continue talking for the next 10 minutes and share the trauma-informed school in, schools initiative in MMPS. Some of you have had guest lectured on one of your classes might have heard that before, or I can do Q&A at this point. So what would meet the needs of your group better? To hear a little more about the trauma-informed initiative, because that's the remainder of the slides, which I can do in 10 minutes, or Q&A. Um, is it okay with you? I shouldn't be asking in front of a room of people. If yeah. we share the presentation? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so I think maybe if we open it to Q&A, and yeah. then they can... Um, advocacy centers are super 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 cool and it's dr snorori's like baby that she saw from the ground up well one of them one of them the initiative is twofold but now uh, let me show you one two more like finish this one and then i'll share a bigger picture slide and then we'll do q a for the last seven eight minutes at that time so to fit because this i mean i think this does illustrate what trauma informed school practices are all about the one thing is safety um i don't need to prolong talking about this but the second one um Focus on regulation, embedding opportunity, teaching regulation, teaching kids that hand model of the brain. Man, that's so empowering because we have so many kids who are like, there's just something wrong with me. I'm just bad. I'm always in trouble. I'm struggling with the academics. Um, and when we teach them this, you're not bad. You just need to learn some skills to shift your state, to, to regulate yourself. That's like super empowering. Um, so regulation and then opportunities to practice. Again, repetition. So we've got just like academic learning, we have to embed lots of opportunities to practice it. We can't, we're not going to strengthen the muscle, say the empathy and regulation muscle, if we don't regularly practice it. So embedding daily opportunities for practice, quick, I'm talking about quick five, 10 minute brain breaks in a given day, right? Um, and then relationships, rich school environments, being connected, and of course, learning. So this would be like the big picture. This is attachment and trauma network. I really like the way they frame trauma from school practices. But the last one I just wanted to share is, I guess, this one. Well, so the whole initiative, just the big picture of it from, say, 2015 to 2021, we were really highly focused on promoting widespread awareness, training and equipping uh, school practitioners, the whole district, teachers, bus drivers, administrators, um, everyone we possibly could, thousands and thousands of people with awareness about this stuff, the impacts of ACEs and what, what to do about it, trauma-informed school practices, and then offering 
a lot of consultation and uh, support for around individual cases or whole classrooms or whole schools to try to promote implementation of these practices. So we had a focus school model um, and now all the way on up to today. So in uh, 2021, we finally were able to get funding for this advocacy centers initiative, which I'll share the slide. So if you wanna check out a little more about what that is, there's even uh, some videos linked in the slides so you can kind of see um, some real world illustrations of what it looks like. So on that note, I think this is a really good time to shift to questions. And I really appreciate all your you, um, listening. So yeah. I have a question. Okay. <laughs> please, please, yeah. Um, so you mentioned Alex yeah. Sharon Bed's book, Equity Center Trauma Informed Education. Yeah. Here. I read that last fall, and I like it's, like uh, really remember her kind of criticizing PBIS and kind of saying some of the flaws and like how PB, I think she actually says yeah. like PBIS and Trauma Informed can't work together. Yeah, I disagree fully. I disagree wholeheartedly on that aspect. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I guess kind of one of the things that I remember her really picking apart was she's talking about. Um, like when it comes to the things that we reward and the things that we like our, our discipline policies and our um really just like how we like, like it's kind of like a one size fits all right even though the idea of people is just to be like individualized like if we have these like very broad categories that end up not being individualized sometimes i kind of just wanted to know like what your response to those kind of critiques are because it's a fabulous book and I, I agree yeah there's so I'm much fruit that. in the book but then there are some areas so my response there um would be twofold. One is that I think that some of the assumptions might have been about like say PBIS and what it is. There may have been some assumptions that had there been really deep training and understanding of some of the, the nuances and true intention and practice of PBIS. I think there may have been some operate to me, I read it from that lens that um, some of the debunking, there's also another a blog out there like, some of the, uh, in fact, the, the uh, Sean Jinrai is like just a really great work, but he had a publication out there that's like, we need to move from uh, trauma from practices, trauma from care to healing centered engagement. And when I read that, like the idea is like, I'm really glad to read it, which is going to be my second response on that. Um, but I was like, wait, that's what trauma informed care is when done right. Like if we're not, so if it's not socially just or racially just, it's not trauma informed. If we're not engaged in healings, that's not trauma informed. Me. To me, that's what trauma informed is. So it's like kind of semantic. So here also like as a behavior analyst, um, I remember back just when I was just fully practicing behavior analysis, reading some, oh gosh, like uh, Josh Green, is that his name? Some perspectives, hot, strong SEL trying to throw out the behavioral perspective. I always appreciated reading the argument against so we could better combat some of those arguments that were fueled by misunderstanding, misconceptions, right, of someone who maybe hadn't been uh, dedicated their education or career to really deeply understanding the premises behind. So, you know, I, to me, I think there can be some appreciating appreciation and seeing the other side while disagreeing. And uh, I'm big on not throwing out the baby with the bathwater. I think our society, society often is like black and white thinking. And what is it? I like SEL, I hate behavior. I like behavior, I hate us. Like it's not, that's not, even in MMPS, yes, I started here, I commented on that. Like actually our, our MTSS graphic, it just now finally got changed back. They took behavior out. It was like academics and SEL. And SC, the behavior analysts fall under the SEL department. It's like, wait a second, you get, but now it's been added back and I'm like, hallelujah. Cause you can't, you can't throw out the baby with the bathwater, right? Like Oliver, I think Joe opened up beautifully by saying like, our field is amazing, <laughs> has so much to offer, but there are areas where we've gotten it wrong, right? So I think that book, the same, like to me, there are some things, and to me, there's some, I mean, I, 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 I take some things with a grain of salt. I mean. She, she comes at it pretty fiercely and calls schools out on a big way. Like it's not re-traumatization at school. We're actually traumatizing at school. Does that happen? Yes. But is that the dominant thing? I don't think so. And if that is the case, sometimes it's things being brought in from the community that lead to original traumatization at school. So yeah, I appreciate seeing the perspective. So we know how to say, I disagree with that. 
and then take the good for the good. But yeah, great informed question. Thank you for that. Um, I'm so, just cutting me off. The two, I'm not cutting you off. <laughs> they just mandatorily, um, it only goes to five, but you're welcome to stay afterwards. But yeah, I I'm just, here for any questions if anybody wants to ask um, individually. I just want to thank you for giving us your Saturday or Friday <laughs> afternoon. Saturday um, Eve. Saturday Eve. Feel the second year to probably so over it, but it's all from the same parts. Um, before you guys leave, can you please do the um exit ticket? If there's anyone that didn't catch me signing in, please come find me, especially if you're a first year and I don't want to